Okay, y'all, this is a video that I've been trying to get through for days, and I would start it and just couldn't do it, and so I'm going to try my best to get through it today so I can get it posted because some of you have been asking about what happened with my husband. He's had health issues for a while, one being high blood pressure, and the doctor that he was originally going to, I did not like because no matter what my husband's issue was, he never sent him to go get testing. And there were a few occasions that some of the things that my husband had going on, he point blank told him that he had no idea what it was. He had never heard of it. I told him then, I said, when your doctor tells you that, it's time for a new doctor. Well, I ended up having something happen last year. And I had not been to my doctor in about three years. And... I ended up in a situation where I ended up having to go back. I had been on high blood pressure medicine, but I had stopped taking it. So when I started back at the clinic that I was going to, I finally got him to decide to go there. And I had been trying to get him to go there for years. So he started seeing a physician's assistant there. I also see a physician's assistant there. They only have one doctor for the whole clinic, and I'm not quite sure what patients that he sees, because personally, I try not to ever see him. I don't like him. But anyway, so he started going to the physician's assistant that he's going to now, and his blood pressure was high, and she changed his medication. She put him on something else. And this didn't work. So she took him off of it. And she put him on something else. That didn't work. And they tried changing the dosages of the new meds and stuff. And they never could get it right. Finally, it took, I don't know, maybe five months to get it completely situated. It, it was definitely four months before they actually got it to where it was leveled out and everything was good. But then she told him that she didn't like his kidney function numbers. And the first time it came back, it was 78. And she talked to him and told him that she didn't like the number, that it wasn't looking too great. The next time she took it, it was 72. And then... The next time she took it, she told him that she was going to send him to a kidney doctor. And at that time, it had dropped to 58. Well, he goes to them. They check it. It's 52. They tell, them, tell him that he is at that point at stage 3 kidney disease, which is bad enough in itself. So... He started trying to drink more water and stay away from some of the things that he'd been drinking, like um, soda. And he wasn't drinking as many of those. He was drinking more water. So it ended up, the next time they did it, it came up to 68, which is really good because that put him back at stage 2. And they told him that he wouldn't require as many office visits because before it was every six weeks and now it's every six months. They don't have to go back until July. However, in April, around the end of April, he was outside cutting grass. And before this, he had had a dry cough. It had been going on for a while. And yes, he was a smoker, but he changed cigarettes. And after he changed the cigarettes that he had started smoking, he started having this dry cough, and it was progressively getting worse. Though he switched back to something else, and he wasn't coughing as much. He started cutting grass, and I was outside at the same time he was cutting grass, and it's um, irritant to me, and... I knew that, but I was out there anyway. And then he and I both ended up getting sick. And I have had to deal with COPD, chronic bronchitis, since I was 
well, all my life actually, but I was only diagnosed with it because I was misdiagnosed with it when I was a child. And I finally got diagnosed with chronic bronchitis when I was 20. So when I get sick with it, I do things to try to keep from getting so sick that it doesn't turn into bronchitis because even when I was at four, when I was four years old, I ended up with pneumonia and I've had issues with it ever since. So I've learned how to basically deal with it and try to keep it from getting so bad so I don't have to get on antibiotics because I don't want antibiotics. Well, he ends up, when he gets sick like that, he gets sicker than I do. So he ended up having to go to the doctor because I told him that he needed to go get something because he wasn't going to get any better until he did. Because normally when he gets something like that, he just keeps getting sick and sick and sick and sicker until he ends up at the doctor anyway. So I was trying to get him to go before he got too sick. So he made an appointment and he was going to be seeing the physician's assistant that he normally sees. And when he got there, he ended up seeing the actual doctor that is at the clinic. Well, when the CNA a came in to do his vitals and, you know, the pre-workup before the doctor comes in and sees you, he told her about the cough that he had and that he was coughing up stuff. And he was. <clears throat> well, I didn't go in with him, and I should have. If I had known it was not going to be his regular doctor or physician's assistant, I would have went in with him. But the doctor didn't even listen to anything he had to say. He didn't check to see if his sinuses was swollen or any of the normal things that they normally check for for something like upper respiratory. He did listen to his lungs and point blank said, you're coughing, you have COPD because your lungs have fluid. You're congested, is what he told him. You're congested. Well, of course he was congested because he had bronchitis. That started out with bronchitis. <clears throat> well, anyway. So, he ended up giving him prednisone and some kind of inhaler. I don't know what the inhaler was, but I do know that he gave him prednisone. I told him not to take it because that doesn't do anything for a sinus infection that ends up possibly being bronchitis. You actually have to have antibiotics to take care of that. But he talked to the pharmacist when they he called to see if it was ready and they told him that that would help with his congestion and stuff when he went to pick it up and he went ahead and got it. <clears throat> Well, he took it, and within a week, he had started having some major problems. He was swelling his face, his neck, especially when he laid down at night. He would swell really bad. He looked like a blowed up toad. Well, I told him, I said, I think that it was the prednisone that did that because it can cause swelling so I told him to go ahead and make another appointment with his doctor physician's assistant and that way he could get some actual things that he needs like he wanted to get the z-pack because that's what he normally takes and it usually fixes his upper respiratory so she prescribed it for him and told him that she'd like to see him come back in two weeks because not only did he have swelling, but he also had broken blood vessels or spider veins, but they were really bad on his chest. The bottom of his chest, there was a whole line, and then there was a couple in another spot. And then a few days after that, those ended up getting worse. I knew something was going on. But she took a picture of it and sent it to a dermatologist for whatever reason. She sent it to a dermatologist. The dermatologist said, oh, it's nothing. 
it's just from where he's been coughing so hard. And he was coughing hard. He was coughing so hard that he w it would take his breath and it would take a couple of seconds for him to be able to catch his breath again and he would turn beet red. His chest, his neck, his face, everything beet red until he was able to catch breath. Well, I was thinking that maybe possibly it could have been from the coffin, but I wasn't sure because, you know, I've seen people cough before and never have that issue, but the way he was coughing, I thought, okay, well, maybe that could be it. So I didn't push the issue. Prior to this visit, I told her that his skin was starting to turn yellow and the whites of his eyes was turning yellow. She told to tell me that that was normal when you have kidney disease. And to a point, it could have been. But his happened really fast and it hadn't been going on before. And his numbers had come up. So if it was going to happen, it should have happened when they were at their lowest point. Anyway, she gave him the z -pack, told him she wanted him to come back in two weeks. Well, the next week, he called to make an appointment because they didn't give him an appointment for the second week that he was supposed to go back. So she saw him again, and at this point, the places on his chest was worse. The swelling wasn't going down, and they had put him on lisinopril, so she told him she thought that that's what the problem was. So she took him off the lisinopril and told him that she wanted him to come back in a week to see how he was doing without being on the lisinopril. So the swelling wasn't getting any better and it was worse when he lay down at night and the places on his chest had gotten worse as well. So she told him that she was concerned about that but prior to these visits he had been having some issues where he told her that he felt like that he had been blacking out and he was real dizzy and especially when he coughed it caused him to feel like he was going to pass out well she didn't seem to be concerned about that but he had an incident the first one that happened he was sitting in the computer chair and he come to his senses leaned over the side of the arm of the computer chair the next time it happened he was leaned forward falling across the computer desk with his head almost leaning onto the monitor there were several other things in that realm that happened and he just told me the other day about more of the incidences that happened like that he didn't tell me all of them otherwise I would have made him go to the hospital because I knew that that wasn't part of what she was saying that all this was and it wasn't coming from a medicine well he goes back to her on the 11th of May and she decides that he's got something going on and she wants him to go have an MRI, a CT scan, a PET scan, a full body scan from tip to toe. Wanted him to have his lymph nodes biopsied. So she finally is starting to get the stuff done that he had been telling her that he needed done to start with. Mind you, this was May 11th. Which was Thursday. On Saturday... He had, now, he had also been taking a lot of naps, and that's not him. Now, when I say naps, he would get up at like 7 o'clock in the morning, go back and lay down at 10, wake up at 12 or 1, stay up for maybe an hour or two, go lay back down and sleep for two or so hours. And then sometimes I would have to wake him up for supper, and he would, after supper, he might stay up till 7, then he would go back to bed and I would have to wake him up to take his night medicine and then he would sleep the rest of the night. That is not him. That is not normal. And I was concerned about that too, but I just kept telling myself, he's just tired. He's just tired. He's just got something going on. He's just tired. Well, 
but Saturday, he had been doing some stuff outside, and around 3 o'clock, he finally come in from doing the last thing that he had decided that he needed to do. I mean, he was taking breaks in between this stuff, but the last thing that he went out and done, he came in, and um, I tried to tell him it was too hot for him to be outside, but he was doing stuff on the tractor, and he's got, you know, a shade thing on the tractor, so he was saying he was going to be fine. Well, he come in around 3, and at some point in time, I decided that I wanted to try to do a video, and I was in there doing a video he was in the living room on the computer and I heard movement in the computer chair and I heard it kick back and then I heard something slam on the floor well I thought that you know maybe he was getting up and his foot had just went to sleep and he was going to be coming through there in a minute and everything you know he would be going to the bathroom or maybe going to the kitchen and he never came in there so I waited a couple of seconds and I got up and went in there and he had the strangest look on his face. And I asked him if he needed anything and he didn't answer me. And I said, are you okay? And he didn't say anything. I said, do you need something? Can I get you something? Do you need something to drink? And he finally said, no. <coughs> Sorry about that. He said, no. But I knew something was wrong. He just didn't look right. The way he was sitting, his, it, 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 his face, everything, everything was just off. So I stood there a second and asked him again if I could do anything. He told me no. Well, I thought, okay, he don't need anything. He don't need me, so I'm, I'm going to go back in here. Well, when I turned around to go back, he said something just happened. I said, what happened? He told me that he started shaking, his whole body started shaking, and he thought that he was in the van, and he was trying to slam on brakes. That's, that's what I heard because he said that he couldn't move his foot, but he did finally one time because that's what I heard and that's what caused the chair to kick back when he actually hit, you know, the floor or whatever. And I immediately said, okay, we're going to the hospital because I knew something bad was going on. This wasn't normal. It wasn't right. And he just sat there and I told him, I said, okay, look, we're going to have to go to the hospital because, you know, you, you have something going on. I don't know what it is, but we're going. And I told him he needed to change clothes because he had been outside and his stuff that he wears around the house. And I told him I was going to go change and he needed to get up to go change. So I got changed and went in there and he was still at the computer. Well, in the beginning when I told him that, he turned, he acted like he was going to turn around and start watching the video he had been watching again. And I told him, you got to get up. you got to change. Well, when I got back in there from me changing, he was watching the video again. I told him, I said, I'm not playing. we got to go to the hospital. Get that thing turned off. Well, he acted like he wasn't going to turn it off. So I reached over to turn it off. And it was like, at that point, it registered that he needed to turn it off. So he turned it off. And... I asked him if he was going to be able to get up and go change clothes and because he he still didn't look good and he said that he didn't think that he could get up I said well, do I need to help you at least change your shirt he says I don't think I can go change I said okay well I'll I'll go get you a shirt and help you change and then I helped, I told him that he wasn't, you know, don't worry about the pants, that I would just put his boots and stuff on. So, he was still sitting there, and he did not look good. And I asked him if he was okay, and he just, he told me that he didn't feel right. He hadn't felt right since whatever happened happened. And 
I said, can you get up now? He told me no. So I sat down in the chair beside of him and waited, I don't know, maybe three more minutes. And I said, are you okay now? Do you think you can get up? Can you go get in the van? I said, because I have to drive you to the, to the hospital because you can't drive. Cause he don't like driving. He don't like me driving. He's one of the people that gets car sick, so he always thinks he has to drive unless it's a dire emergency. Well, he told me that he still didn't think that he could get up. At that point, I asked him if he needed me to call an ambulance. And he told me yes. And when he wants to go by an ambulance, it is bad. Because there's only been two times that he's ever needed an ambulance. One time was when he was having something going on. And we thought he was having a heart attack. And the other time was he had ripped his eye open with a nail. And he ended up at the emergency room. And he got transferred from Shelby to Charlotte that time as well. So I knew that if he wanted an ambulance, that it was pretty bad. There is a satellite ambulance um, facility up above our house. It should have only taken them about three minutes to get here. It took them over 30 minutes to get here. I was not happy about that whatsoever because, you know, if he, if he would have just been able to get up, I could have gotten him to the hospital sooner. But on the plus side, him going by ambulance, that got the hot seat under the emergency room people and got things rolling quicker than it would have if you walked in, which was a blessing in disguise, I suppose, to a point. Well, our youngest son and I was going to go up there to the hospital but we wasn't in a rush because we knew, you know, that they would have to get him out and get him checked in and, and all that stuff before they would let us come back since he went via ambulance. So when we did get there, he wasn't in a room. We got there about 10 minutes after he did. <coughs> he wasn't in a room yet. So we had to wait. In about an hour. I went back up there and, and asked about him, and he was in a room at that point in time. And apparently they had done ran quite a few tests on him, too. Because what he had going on at that point in time was an emergency situation. So we get him to the hospital. Or they get him in his room, and I, we get back there and to his room. And it just went downhill from that point. So we didn't get back there till about 20 minutes after 5. He got to the hospital himself about 20 minutes after 4. We didn't get to his room in the emergency room department until, you know, 5.30ish, 5.20, whatever. And... We were there and waiting, and when I walked in, there was another physician's assistant because apparently we don't have enough true doctors anymore. They're all physician's assistants, but she was pretty good, and, and I didn't have an issue with her. So she explained that they had done some tests and that they were waiting on results on some of the tests that they had done. And now it was just a waiting game, but they, they had an idea what they thought it was, but they wouldn't tell us until they were sure. About an hour later, they came in and told him that he had what they called superior vena cava syndrome. And that they had done some imaging because they had an idea of what may be causing it but they wanted to be sure before they said anything about that too. And I guess it was another 45 minutes and they came in and told him that they had confirmed what their suspicion was and what was called the superior vena cava syndrome. They told him 
that he has a mass in his chest near his heart and I I was I was floored well we were told that they were going to transport him to Charlotte because they would do surgery and they were consulting with Charlotte to see what was going to happen then about an hour and a half later they decided that surgery wasn't an option they didn't do surgery on this but they still wanted to transport him to Charlotte for him to be able to get treatment there because they said that they didn't do the treatment here at our hospital well turns out that they do do the treatment here but they wanted him to be at Charlotte because they could do it quicker or was supposed to have been able to do it quicker so we're at this point waiting basically on transport and he was kind of they they had him sitting up more or less on the bed and he wanted it chopped down some so we put it down a little bit he still wasn't happy and he said he wanted it put down a little bit more which I understand that because trying to sit up on them hospital beds is not easy so we did lower it a little bit more and, and told him you know you can't have it any lower than that well even at the position that he had it at it was too low because I was sitting in one of the chairs at the foot of the bed and I noticed that he had stopped breathing and I looked up at the monitor and saw his oxygen level dropping from 95 90 85 80 75 and at this point I think oh my god he stopped breathing so I kind of kicked his foot a little bit didn't do anything I kicked it a little bit harder it still didn't do anything so I kicked him pretty hard and that's when he took a breath and I told him I said you can't lay down like that you need to be raised up some more so we did raise him back up some and I had went out to go to the restroom and in the few minutes very few minutes that I was in there something happened and our youngest son came out because I went in and, and he said something about he wanted to tell me something so we went out in the hallway and he told me what happened he explained what he saw and I told him I said well, I don't I don't know what that was I said it wasn't good I know that oh and by the way when his his oxygen started dropping nobody came to check on him nobody and then I want to say maybe 30 minutes later it happened again and what was happening was he was having seizures his he's kind of set up in the bed a little bit and then he his whole body stiffened arms hands clenched legs and his feet kind of pushed out and he was in a full-blown seizure his head tilted back his eyes rolled back in his head he was not breathing and this lasted for a good 25 or 30 seconds and it was so long that at this point in time with what was going on I thought he was actively dying at that point in time and it terrified me and I called his name and you know I mean when you're seizing there's <laughs> you're not there it, you just have to wait till it gets over and when he he when when it happened and he was come back he was so confused for you know a few minutes and when he could finally talk he said that's what's been happening just not as severe and 
I told him, I said, you know, I didn't know that they were that bad. I didn't know that that's what was really happening because I would have had him to the hospital sooner. I was a CNA at one point in time, y'all. I was a CNA too. And I've seen people have seizures. But even before I was a CNA. But I also studied as much as I could because I wanted to be a nurse. So I studied, you know, everything. And I've learned quite a bit. And when it's other people, you can deal with it. When it's your family or your husband, you, you just, you're not prepared for that. I'm telling you, when I saw what he had done at that point in time, I lost it. I had to go out in the hall and I just bawled because I knew things were bad and like I said I thought he was dying at that point in time and even then they still didn't come and check on him because I know I didn't look at the monitor but I guarantee you his oxygen dropped again things had to have been screwed up because they were monitoring him out front wherever they had their nurses station he was being monitored but nobody came and then we found out that, you know, they shut the trauma unit down, which is where they had him at. They, they closed that section down at 11 o'clock, and they left him back there. From 11 to about 2 o'clock in the morning, we didn't see anybody. But at some point in time, and I'm not quite sure, it was a long time after his oxygen level dropped and the other stuff happened that the person on duty finally come back there and of course she had excuses and they were busy I, I will admit they they were busy they had you know bang bangs happening that night many many people did not make it but they locked the hospital down it was horrible and I know they were busy like I said I know it was a bad situation that night all the way around but still you don't put a patient in a room and you and forget about them but when she finally did come in there I told her I said he stopped breathing she said yeah they told me that he had stopped breathing but uh it come back up I said you know why it come back up I said because I kicked the crap out of him for him to uh breathe again and she just looked at me like you know she she was to so totally shocked and you know like oh I effed up well, yeah, she did, because nobody came, and they should have. I told her about him having the seizures. So she says, okay, well, I'll tell the attending physician, the actual physician. Well, he finally comes in there, and all he does is tell him, uh, sir, you can't lay down. You're going to have to sit up. You can't lay down. So he raises his bed more. And then... That was the last that we saw of him, too. Well, he wasn't sleeping. He wasn't being comfortable. And finally, our youngest said that he was going to go try to sleep in the car for a while. So at that point, I crawled up beside of my husband and, and laid down beside of him and he put his arm around me, and when he did, it relaxed him enough for me to be in the bed with him that he actually started sleeping. So, he slept some. I stayed awake all night. And because after he stopped breathing, you know, I was terrified it might happen again. So, I watched him because apparently nobody was going to come if something happened. Like I said, they shut the unit down at 11 o'clock. And because they thought he was going to do surgery, they wouldn't let him have anything to eat. He wasn't allowed to drink. So, he didn't get anything. And they kept telling him, oh, transport's coming, transport's coming. Well, finally, about 4.30 in the morning, they had, I guess, a shift change at 5. I don't know. It's usually at 7 o'clock, but they had people coming in about 4.30. I don't know. I don't know who these people were. But I do know that there was a, a night manager nurse that she finally came through there. 
and I asked her if he could have something to eat or drink because he had not had anything to drink. He was had not had anything to eat. She said, sure, I can get him something to drink, but all I got is crackers. I said, well, you know, anything's better than nothing because he hasn't had anything since, you know, Friday evening because he didn't eat breakfast Saturday and he didn't eat lunch Saturday. So, you know, he, he had been without food as I had been too, but, you know, it was all about him at this point. But she did bring us both crackers and a drink. And I, I didn't want mine. Matter of fact, um, on the way to the hospital, we had got something to drink and I had gotten a candy bar. And I didn't eat it either. I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't eat at that point in time. And finally, the next morning, I'm going to say it was around 11 o'clock, the attending physician's assistant that had been there came in and she says, oh, I see y'all are still here. And I said, yeah, we are. And I'm still waiting on transport. She said, well, I, I looked over his scans and um, I saw that it had spread to his liver. I said, excuse me? She said, it, it has spread to his liver. Did they not tell you that? I said, no. No, they didn't tell me that. And I started crying. Because, you know, it's bad enough that I find out that my husband's got lung cancer. It is now metastasized to his liver. And I knew that was bad. I knew it was bad. And... So, we're you now having to deal with all this stuff. And he, he still is at, you know, the ER and trauma unit and, and not transferred yet. And 12 o'clock comes, 1 o'clock comes. Finally, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they say, transport is on the way and they finally get there it is 24 hours later and they finally get there to transport him to charlotte and i told him that you know we would follow or come to charlotte we weren't going to follow because we needed to come home and check on our pets i said that well didn't say that i put that in the other small video that i had done so we came home and checked on the animals and um, then we went on down down there and we got there I want to say it was 5 30 ish when we got there maybe 15 till 6 and at this point he still had not been given anything to eat or drink but they did have a room assigned to him already which was good because you know he knew he was going to have a room when he got there and didn't have to wait down there before he had a room. But finally, we were able to get a voucher to go get him something to eat. And the doctors came in, his team came in and introduced themselves and explained what was going on and what they wanted to do and that they were going to do some biopsies and make sure that everything was what they thought it was before they decided on a treatment. So all that ended up getting done and they decided to start doing chemo but he didn't get that until Wednesday which I'm glad that he went to Charlotte and I'm glad that he got all that done. However we found out that they do do chemo treatment here. They have a Levine Center here at our local hospital. But I'm glad that he was at Charlotte because it turned out that it, you know, it's a really good hospital and it was uh, Caroline's Medical Center. Really good hospital, really good doctors, nurses was great, everything was awesome. And then finally, he started the chemo Wednesday. So he got the treatment Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and they were going to send him home on Saturday, which happened to be his 64th 
birthday. And one of the attendings came in to talk to him and tell him that it looked like they were going to go ahead and release him. And they had wanted him to do an MRI, but because he couldn't lay flat. And by the way, he ended up on oxygen. He, he was put on oxygen at Shelby and on two liters. They went to take a test. I don't remember what test they went to do. Um, I don't remember what it was, but whatever it was, he couldn't tolerate that. So they ended up upping the oxygen then to three. And at some point in time, and I have no idea what time they did it, they ended up opening it to four. So I didn't get to stay with him Sunday night because I had to come home and get a vehicle and my clothes and stuff that I was going to take because I was going to go stay with him. I ended up staying until he left Saturday. So I got there Monday and ended up staying until he left Saturday. But she comes in and tells him that he's going to get to go home. And she says something about the MRI that he didn't ever get it done. And I told her, that yeah, he got it done last night at like 7 o'clock in the evening. And she's like, oh, great, let me pull up the results. So she grabs her phone, pulls up the results. And uh, her face drops. And she says, I don't think you're going to be going home today. It depends on what radiology wants to do. But you have a mass on your lower left lobe. And she said, it's only one nodule. And thankfully, your brain hasn't recognized it yet. And as she was saying... You have a nodule in your brain? I just started crying. So, that is how we found out that my husband has stage 4 lung cancer that has metastasized to his liver and to his brain. And that is why... I put up the little video that I put up right after he got out of the hospital asking for prayers and asking for good thoughts and asking you for good vibrations you know all positivity because stage 4 lung cancer has gone to the liver and to the brain doctors at Charlotte told him that they were pretty confident that they could get rid of what's going on with his chest and that they would put him on a maintenance plan for his liver but that was before they found out that he had the nodule in his brain we didn't get to talk to the that team after that because you know he did get to go home Saturday it was after seven o'clock in the evening before he got to go home but he got to go home on his 64th birthday after finding out all this and then um, I, I don't I don't know how things are going to actually go. They, he does have a radiation appointment set up. He has talked to radiation up here and they told him that there's a possibility that the chemo could take care of the nodule in his brain but they may end up having to do um, radiation on of the the mass in his chest and on his brain but you know it it depends on how your body reacts to everything so that's what we've got going on and we're having to deal with it and 
I have my good days and bad days and that's why I couldn't make the video I tried to make it Tuesday but Tuesday here he had to start his first chemo it was supposed to start it last week but his white blood counts were too low they were almost too low Tuesday they were two points two points it, it, it has to be 1.50 his was 1.52, so he just barely made it. They gave him antibiotics a week before last to, for him to be able to do it. And now I gotta worry about whether or not his white blood counts are gonna stay up to be able to get the chemo that he needs. And, um, anyway, I tried to do the video Tuesday but it ended up being a four hour treatment because in Charlotte it was only an hour and a half but they added stuff here so it ended up being four hours and we got to the hospital or to the Levine's Cancer Center at eight o'clock in the morning and he wasn't done until two and I sat by his treatment center holding his hand and crying and I, I just I didn't want to leave him because they told him that because they were introducing a new medicine that he could have a, an allergic reaction or a bad reaction to it so I didn't want to leave him I wanted to make sure he was okay so that's how come I couldn't do it Tuesday and then I tried to do it Wednesday and today is Thursday and I'm getting through it <laughs> but anyway I'm rambling and so once again I, I've asked for um, for y'all to keep us in your thoughts and prayers and if you have a prayer group or know anybody that has a prayer group you know just to say you know say a prayer for the lady whose husband found out that he has stage 4 lung cancer and that has spread he's got a CD coming up Monday, a CT scan coming up Monday and another MRI because they want to see if anything has shrunk but he is able to lay down a little bit more now and he's not really needing the oxygen but he's, he really can't get out and do much we get out and try to do a few things so he's not just sitting in the house because that makes him miserable but he can't get out and do stuff like he was doing which makes him miserable which makes me miserable because he's miserable <laughs> but anyway like I said I'm rambling and if you made it to the end of this video thank you for listening and Keep us in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you.